So, um, you know, a quick one for all those who have joined probably for the first time or maybe the second time, may not know Maharaj or may know, but a quick introduction. His Holiness Atman Vedan Swami Maharaj joins us from Bhaktivedanta Manor. He joined International Society for Krishna Consciousness at the age of 22, way back in 1979. And um, Maharaj took sannyas in 1993. And uh, he is one of our initiating guru in our movement, though he's based out of the manor in the UK, but he travels all over uh, in Europe, in Asia, India, and the Middle East. And he's also overseeing many projects, but one of them is a very important one for the pleasure of Srila Prabhupada, the project in Madhya Pradesh, India, in a very beautiful place called Narsingpur on the banks of River Narmada. There is a temple that is being under construction and Maharaj is overseeing that. Uh, project besides other projects that Maharaj has. So we are extremely fortunate to have him and his association and the wonderful sessions that he has been uh, delivering for the benefit of all of us from the lockdown. Particularly, I wish to inform every one of you that we had wonderful sessions on the Bhagavad Gita. We have in fact completed the entire Bhagavad Gita overview but more than the overview, really, it was quite, quite a bit of deep dive. And uh, you can uh, take the benefit of those sessions from our YouTube channel, School of Vedic Studies. And, uh, and Maharaj then started last week the 12 Mahajan series. Uh, it's really one of its kind to get an insight into the lives of these wonderful pure devotees of the Lord, the 12 Mahajans, as they are mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam. Maharaj took us through uh, the, the life of Lord Brahma, and today it will be Sri Naraji. So again, let's all of us say three times, Hari Bol and welcome Maharaj. Hari Bol. Hari Bol. Hari Bol. Hari Bol. Without much ado. So without much ado, I would now, um, you know, request Maharaj to begin the session. The session will be for one hour. We will keep about 15 odd minutes for question and answers. And as usual, at the end of the session in a day or two, you will have the questions. And then, you know, once you send them in, then obviously, you know, uh, there will also be the presentation that Maharaj sends that will also be shared with all of you. So, Hare Krishna, Maharaj, let's begin. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Om Ajnana Tamadandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chakshu Zumitam Yenata Asme Sri Guru Enamaha Panchakal Patro Vyasha, Kripas in Dhuvyacha, Patitanam, Pavanibyo, Vaishnabyo, Namo Namaha. Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sivasa Divor Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, the twelve Mahajans. As we have just uh, heard from Rasakrita Prabhu, that last week was Lord Brahma. And uh, this week is number two on the list is Sri Narad Muni. Also sometimes addressed as Bhagavan Narad. So this, uh, just to go over the verse in Srimad Bhagavatam, it says Lord Brahma, Bhagavan Narada. Lord Shiva, the four Kumaras, Lord Kapila, the son of Devahuti. And uh, 
प्रहलाद महाराज स्वयं भू मनु जनक महाराज ग्रांड फादर भीष्मा बाली महाराज सुखदेव गोस्वामी एंड आई यामा माई सेल्फ आर नोन माई सेल्फ नो द रियल रिलीजियस प्रिंसिपल्स so of course these are the people mahajans who actually really understands the principle of dharma and they propagate in different ways so sri prabhupad gives a little uh, insight to this uh, verse where he says my dear servants this transcendental religious principle which is known as bhagavad dharma or surrender unto the supreme lord and the love for him is uncontaminated by the material modes of nature it is very confidential and It is very confidential and difficult for ordinary human beings to understand. But if by chance one fortunately understands it, he is immediately liberated, and, and thus he returns back home, back to Godhead. So this is Prabhupada emphasizing uh, that anyone who receives this causeless mercy to understand Bhagavad Dharma, then he is or she is indeed very fortunate. They can go back home, back to Godhead. So the second Mahajan. is bhagwan narada and proper explains that sometimes narada muni is also addressed as bhagwan so we must not understand misunderstand that when we say bhagwan narada doesn't mean that narada muni has become god it is just that because he is a representative of the supreme lord and therefore he is also possessing the same opulence as the supreme lord and therefore he is addressed as bhagwan narada so this is the transcendental personality of shri narada muni as we will go through this uh, presentation we will understand that narada muni is a uh, indeed very very fortunate person that at the end of lord brahma's day after he finished his birth as a maid servant son in the same very body he went back into the body of brahma and then later on in the day of brahma recreation happened narada muni appeared in the same body and that the same body is blessed that he can enter into the material world into the spiritual world at free will it is not an ordinary personality his body is transcendental so we will go on to the three lives of narada muni explaining his his uh, position so first one is as a gandharva so it is mentioned in the scriptures that in the in his previous birth narada Narada was a Gandharva, an angelic being, who had been cursed to be born on the earthly planet for seeing glories of the demigods instead of the supreme Lord. He was born as a son of a maid servant of some particular saintly priest. So you can see the Narada Muni was a, a Gandharva, and we all know from the descriptions given in the Shrimad Bhagavatam that the residents of Gandharva Loka are very angelic, very beautiful. and endowed with beautiful angelic voice and they are always singing the glories of the lord so in the in the bhagavatam in the 7th canto of uh, simad bhagavatam chapter 15 text 69 is mentioned by the lord uh, narada muni himself he is saying long long ago in another mahakalpa millennium of brahma i existed as gandharva known as upa brahma upa bharma varhana i was very respected by by the other gandharvas so narada muni is establishing his his own position saying that in a, in a different millennium he was born as a gandharva as upa upa bar uh, upa barhana and he was also very well respected by all the other gandharva lokas uh, or residents of gandharva loka and the proper proper saying shri narada muni is giving a practical example from his past life formerly during his previous life lifetime of lord brahma narada muni was one of the denses of the gandharva loka but but unfortunately as will be explained he fell from his exalted position of gandharva loka where the inhabitants are extremely beautiful and expert at singing to become a sudra nonetheless because because of his because of his association with devotees he became more fortunate than he was in gandharva loka even though cursed by the prajapatis to become a sudra in his next life he became the son of brahma now there is very important point where prabhu is mentioning here that nonetheless because of his association with devotees he became more fortunate than he was in gandharva loka of course gandharva loka is the higher planets the heavenly planets 
where things are much, much better situated than our earthly planet. But as Prabhupada is saying, nonetheless, he was more fortunate. Why? Because he had association of devotees. And therefore, it is very important to understand that in our present situation, when we have, when we have opportunity to associate with devotees of Krishna, then it is the most fortunate position for us because by associating with devotees, we actually develop uh, purity in our hearts and attraction to serve the Supreme Lord Krishna. So in the next verse, I had a beautiful face and a pleasing, attractive bodily structure, decorated with flower garlands and sandalwood. I was most pleasing to the women of my city. Thus, I was bewildered, always feeling lusty and desire. So for Narad Muni is again blessing himself, saying he has such a beautiful bodily features, he was so attractive. And, uh, and all the women of the city were attracted to him, were, they were very pleasing to him. And he became bewildered and always, all the time, these nasty feelings came. So we have a similar experience in this world also. Sometimes we are proud of our uh, God-given beauty and we think we are so beautiful. God's gift to mankind, you can say, that we become attractive to, attracted to other people and we feel so much uh, uh, puffed up and thinking I'm so great. And also, of course, when you... When you associate with uh, opposite sex, men for women and women for men, then lusty desires arise. So from the description of the beauty of Narda, Narda Muni, when he was one of the dancers in Gandhav Loka, it appears that everyone on that planet is extremely beautiful, and pleasing, and always decorated with flowers and sandalwood. Upabarhana was Narda Muni's name previously. Upabarhana was specifically expert in decorating himself to attract the attention of women. And thus he became a playboy, as described in the next verse. Once there was a Sanketan festival to glorify the Supreme Lord in the assembly of the demigods. The Gandharvas and the Apsaras were invited by the Prajapati to take part in it. Of course, you know, we, we also see in this uh, planet of ours, that devotees are sometimes invited to different programs to perform Sankirtan or go to house programs and perform Sankirtan. So similarly, the Gandhava Lokas who are very endowed with beautiful singing voice, they were invited by Prajapati to come and participate in the Sankirtan festival there. So it is said by the Prabhupada, Sankirtan means chanting of the holy name, the Lord. The Hare Krishna movement is not a new movement as people sometimes mistakenly think. The Hare Krishna movement is presently is present in every millennium of Lord Brahma's life. The holy name is chanted in all the higher planetary systems, including Brahma Loka and Chandra Loka, not to speak of Gandhara Loka and Apsara Loka. So it is said that uh, everywhere uh, the, the holy name is chanted in every millennium. So it is not something new. Of course, because the exposure of the Hare Krishna movement in 1965, when Srila Prabhupada brought it to the West and then he spread all over the world, then people started thinking that this is something new. But as Prabhupada is mentioning, that every millennium of Brahma, there is a Sankirtan movement going on. So the Sankirtan movement was started in this world 500 years ago by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is therefore not a new movement. Sometimes because of our bad luck, this movement is stopped. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his servants again started the movement for the benefit of the entire world or indeed the entire universe. Uh, is someone playing around with the screen? Because I'm getting all these lines appearing on my screen. Uh, Maharaj, that's, there is a, since you're the co-host also because you're sharing, there's an annotation. Uh, how to stop it? Uh, what do we have to do? Maharaj has to do it uh, from his end, right? Yeah, you have to go to Maharaj's settings and there is something called annotations. Disable annotations. Uh, so I have to come out of my uh, PowerPoint? Uh, yeah, you, you will have to, Maharaj. Okay, sorry for this inconvenient.
I cannot find the settings. Where is the settings? But you'll have to stop the share screen and okay. then share it again after you. Okay, so we are on uh, slide 15 or 14. Okay, no problem. So I go to the uh, settings. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, where is the settings now? Kind, kindly guide me. Okay. Now just share it again. Okay. So, Maharaj, just don't go into settings. Now share again. Just okay. share the screen. Yeah, just share your screen again, Maharaj. Yes. Yeah, so it's gone. So <laughs> we'll continue, sorry for these interruptions. Narayuni continued, being invited to that festival, I also joined and surrounded by women, I began musically singing the glories of the demigods. Because of this, the Prajapatis, the great demigods in charge of the affairs of universe forcefully cursed me with these words. Because you have committed an offense, may you immediately become a Sudra devoid of beauty. So, the Prajapatis curse Narada Muni for singing the demigod glories instead of the glories of the, whole, uh, the Supreme Lord. So the little uh, purple prop are saying, as far as Kirtan is concerned, the Shastra says, Savanam Kirtanam Vishnu. This is men mentioned in the seventh canto of Bhagavatam, chapter 5, text 23. One should chant the glories of the Supreme Lord and the holy name of the Supreme Lord. This is clearly stated, Savanam Kirtanam Vishnu. One should chant about the about about and the glory of the Lord about Lord Vishnu, not any demigod. So of course, this verse is spoken by Prahlad Maharaj, where he says Savanam Kirtan Vishnu Smaranam, that it only means that we chant the glories of the Lord Himself and not anybody else. Unfortunately, there are foolish persons who invent some process of kirtan on the basis of demigod's name. This is an offense. Kirtan means glorifying the Supreme Lord, not any demigods. Sometimes people invent Kali Kirtan or Shiva Kirtan. And even big sannyasis in the Mayavadi school say that one may chant any name and still get the same result. So this is uh, uh, Prabhupada is emphasizing that if you do not chant the holy name, and if you think that chanting other name than the holy name of the Lord is same, then it is considered an aparad or an offense. So in the next text, although I took birth as a sudra from a womb of a maid servant, I engaged in the service of Vaishnavas who were well versed in the Vedic knowledge. Consequently, in this life, I got the opportunity to take birth as a son of Brahma. So, of course, when he took uh, the birth as sudra, uh, he was serving the Vaishnavas and a result of that was that he got a chance to become son of Brahma. Narayana is explaining this in, the, in relation to his own life. The Sankirtan movement is important for regardless of whether one is a Sudra, Vaisha, Malaysia, Yavana, or whatever, if one associates with a pure devotee, follows in his instructions and serves the pure devotee, his life is successful. The Prabhupada is very clearly saying that it doesn't matter what situation we are born in, what caste, color, creed, is irrelevant because on a spiritual level, as a spirit soul, if that person, in whatever body you are, associate with the devotees, then your life becomes successful. So the bhakti, this is bhakti. Anukulayana Krishnanu Silanam. In the Chaitanya Charitamrit Madhalila, chapter 19, X167. Bhakti consists of serving Krishna and his devotees very favorably. Anya Bilasita Sunyam. Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 1111 says, if one has no desire other than to serve Krishna and his devotees, then his life is successful. This is explained by Narada Muni through his practical example of his own life. So as we, see, we understand, Narada Muni is one of the Mahajans. And as a Mahajan, he is knower of the religious principles and he knows the truth. And therefore, he is actually giving his own example of how we can become successful. And he's teaching us the, the modest of bhakti. 
So the, the process of chanting the holy name of the Lord is so powerful that by this chanting, even householders, griastas, can very easily gain the ultimate result achieved by persons in the renounced order. Maharaj Yudhisthir, I have now explained to you the, the to you the process of religion. So of course, Narad only is speaking to Yudhisthira Maharaj, because Yudhisthira Maharaj was questioning that how is it possible for me to become free from this situation? I am a householder. Narad Muni says that if you take the shelter of the Supreme Lord in the spirit of Sankirtan and Bhakti, then even if you're a householder, you can become free from this. So in the Purpur Prabhupada says, this is the confirmation of Krishna consciousness movement. Anyone who takes part in this movement, regardless of what he is, can gain the topmost result achieved by the perfect sannyasi, namely Brahman Gyan, spiritual knowledge. Even more important, he can advance in devotional service. Maharaj Yudhishthira thought that because he was a Griyasta, there was no hope for his being liberated. And therefore he asked Narada Muni how he could get out of this material entanglement. But Narada Muni is citing the practical example from his own life, establishing that by associating with devotees and chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, any man in any condition of life can achieve the highest perfection without doubt. So Narada Muni is very, very clearly citing this uh, practice that just simply associate with the devotees of the Lord. And in association of devotees, chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and you will achieve the perfection without doubt. So the second birth, as we know that he was cursed by the Prajapatis to become a Sudra. And his second birth was in the womb of a maid servant. So the, the maid servant was serving all the sadhus in the forest. And in this, this picture, you can see the little Narada Muni is playing in the grounds. And actually, he is trying to eat some remnants of Mahaprasad left. As you can see in the picture that he is sitting by the banana leaf in pots where the sadhus have already honored their prasadam. And he is honoring their prasadam after taking their permission. So it is said, there lived Kanya Kubja. In Kanya Kubja, the emperor named Drumila. He, along with his wife, Kalavati, performed penances on the banks of Ganga, or Ganges, for an offspring. Kalavati pleased Kasyapa by her worshiping, by her worship, and with his blessing, she became pregnant. Drumila, who in the meantime had renounced everything in life, decided to spend the rest of his life in the forest. So this emperor, Drumila, and his wife, Kalavati, they, they were, uh, you know, not ordinary persons. Uh, they were, uh, you know, princely people. But as we see how Kalavati became a maid servant. So he was gifted, he gifted away all his wealth to the Brahmins and died in the forest. Though Kalavati got ready to follow him in the funeral pyre, a siestal voice stopped her and she, and she refrained from committing self-immolation, sati. Of course, in the Vedic times, when the husband dies, then the wife would give up her life voluntarily to join her husband in the next life. But here, the siestal voice says, don't commit this offense. Because at the time, she was carrying a child in her womb. And that would be a, a greater sin to kill a child in the womb. So she returned to the village and lived as a servant, of a, servant in a Brahmin's house. In due course of time, she delivered a son. On the birth of the child, it rained in the land, which was suffering from failure of rains. And because of that, the Brahmin master of Kalavati named the child Narada, meaning he who brings water. So we, should, we know now the name of Narada means one who brings water. When the child Narada grew up, he told his mother the story about his former birth. He turned out to be a great devotee of Vishnu. Meanwhile, Kalavati, who went to milk a cow at night, she was beaten by a snake and died. And Narada was orphaned. Shiva and three attendants of his who went there in disguise were pleased at Narada's great devotion for Vishnu and his service mentality. He, he lived on the leftovers given by them 
repeated songs sung by them about Vishnu. Gradually, Narada became a perfect devotee of Vishnu and, and a unique master of music. So, of course, the saintly persons were none other than Lord Shiva and his associates. And they were there to plea, to bless Narada Muni because obviously we all know that Narada Muni, due to curse, he had to take that birth. But prior to that, he was a great person singing the glories of the Lord. And therefore, Lord Shiva, out of his causeless mercy, he comes with his uh, associates to bless Narada. And Narada learns this transcendental music and glorification of Vishnu. Shiva and others imparted Bhagavat to Narada before, he, before they left him. Narada, who thus attained divine knowledge, performed penance for many years on the banks of the Ganges and died there. This is in the Bhagavatam 7th chapter, 7th canto rather. So now Narada Muni has uh, taken birth as a, as a maid servant's uh, son. He is serving the Vaishnavas and taking association with Vaishnavas. By that, he becomes perfect. Then, of course, by performing penances at the appropriate time, he gives up that body and then he takes the next body. And this is at the end of the millennium when everything is merging back into the uh, uh, Brahma's uh, night. When Brahma's night comes, everything becomes suspended. The next day when Brahma awakes, as we studied in the last week's understanding of Lord Brahma, the new creation begins. And when new creation begins, then everything comes out again. So... The third birth, Narada Muni is born as son of, son of Lord Brahma. So, in this slide, we see that Narada Muni is born from the body of Brahma, and many other great rishis also are born from the body of Brahma. And as we see, that Narada was transcendentally blessed by music, and he carried on his musical talents from his previous life into this present life. Therefore, he is known as the siestal singer of the holy names with his transcendental veena. So at the end of the millennium, when the personality of God at Lord Narayan lay down within the waters of devastation, Brahma began to, end, Brahma began to enter into a law. Uh, Brahma entered in him along with all the creative elements. And I also entered through his breathing. So at the end of the millennium, Brahma goes to sleep. Everything goes into the body of Vishnu. And the next day when Brahma wakes up, again, the same process starts. So after 4,300 million solar years, that is the one day of Brahma and also one night of Brahma, when Brahma awoke to create again by, by the will of the Lord, all the rishis like Marichi, Angira, Atri, and so on were created from the transcendental body of the Lord. And I also appeared along with them. So... And Brahma awoke and he started the creation again. All the great rishis and prajapatis, everybody was created along with them. As Nada Muni is saying, I also appeared along with them. The duration of the day in the life of Brahma is 4,320 4, million solar years. This is stated also in the Bhagavad Gita. For this period, Brahmachis rest in Yoga Nidra within the body of Garbhadakshaya Vishnu, the generator of Brahma. Thus, after the sleeping period of Brahma, when there is again creation by the will of the Lord, though through the agency of Brahma, all the great rishis again appear from different parts of the transcendental body, and, Na and Narada also appear. This means that Narada appeared in the same transcendental body, just as the man awakes from sleep in the same body. Sri Narada is an eternally free is eternally free to move in all parts of the transcendental and material creation of the Almighty. He appears and disappears in his own transcendental body, which is without distinction of the body and soul, unlike conditioned beings. So, of course, many times we understand that we are not this body, we are spirit soul. But in this case, Naradhuni, his body and his soul are the same. It is not different. Therefore, is transcendental body, which appears, disappears, as it is in the same body, just like the Supreme Lord. And Prabhupada mentions that when we are freed from our engagement of this Panchabhuta body, imprisonment of this material body, then also we go back to the spiritual world in our Nitya Surupa, our eternal uh, uh, Surupa or eternal uh, form. And that form 
then there is no soul. And the soul is the body, and body is the soul. So Narada uh, teachings are there in Narada Bhakti Sutra. So there are eighty-four sutras for practicing bhakti devotion to the Supreme Lord Krishna. So this is the the transcendental teachings which Narada Muni has given us, through which we can actually raise ourselves from the lowest level as beginners. What I call kindergarten school to the highest university university post graduation of the of the bhakti school. So when we are going through these phases of studying uh, Narada Bhakti Sutra, we can actually advance from the lowest position to the highest position. So this is the book called Bhakti uh, Narada Bhakti Sutra. It is translated by Shila Prabhupada. So I would recommend highly to all the devotees if you don't have this book. Then uh, you can Google and download a PDF version. Otherwise, you can order it from the BBT. Uh, it is your choice. But nonetheless, I would advise you that please read this book. It is a very interesting book. It will improve your understanding of bhakti. So Narada Muni, the preacher. So Narada Muni, as he as he's preaching the bhakti sutras, he, wherever he goes, he's always speaking about the transcendental subject matter of bhakti. As you can see from this slide, there are thousands of sadhus, saintly people sitting there on the banks of the river. Narada Muni is singing the glories uh, of the Lord and teaching them the essence of bhakti. So Narada, Narada Bhakti Sutra, aphorisms of divine love, were first expounded by Devarishi Narada thousands of years ago on the request of Maharishi Vedavyas in Badrik Ashram. Maharishi Vedavyas asked Narada, main six freedom. This seeking without devotion is dry. Many paths lead to freedom, but they have, but they have importance only in so far as they are auxiliary to devotion. I therefore humbly ask you to reveal the virtues of devotion. So many times we see people are practicing different forms of religious uh, disciplines, but it is not directly bhakti. So here, where we ask is uh, requesting his spiritual master, Narada Muni, that you kindly please give the direct virtues of devotion, which will free mankind from going here, there, everywhere, and coming to the point, which is bhakti. So in reply, Sage Narada explained all the aspects of path of divine love through the 84 sutras, aphorisms. These aphorisms are referred to as Narada Bhakti Sutra. The Bhakti Sutra of, this, of Sage Narada, Sage Narada, considered to be the best guide on the path of devotion, stand out for their clarity, simplicity, and internal coherence. So we can understand what Prabhupada is saying here, that the Narada Bhakti Sutras are so simple and clear and to the point that we cannot misunderstand them. We, it is a very straightforward explanation of bhakti. So the first 14 sutras deal with the value of bhakti. The next 19 sutras from 15 to 33 explain why the path of bhakti is superior, defining bhakti in, in clearer terms. Then the next 17 sutras, 34 to 50, describe the method by which bhakti can be cultivated and practiced. Next 16 sutras, 51 to 66, gives the sign of true devotion, means to actually dive into the real essence of pure bhakti. In the last 18 sutras, 67 to 84, glorify those who have reached the pinnacle of devotion. So we can see through this uh, slide from the beginning till the end, how it is raising us gradually to the highest level. And if you follow this, then we can get perfection in our lives. So of course, Narada Muni is a transcendental personality. And sometimes all great personalities get bewildered by the illusion of Maya. So nobody is free from the clutches of Maya or illusionary deity. We all fell victims of this. And what to speak of us as ordinary mortals, great personalities like Narada Muni, and previously we discussed Lord Brahma, also was a little bit uh, bewildered by Krishna's pastimes. So here, Narada Muni is also sometimes uh, becomes very uh, puffed up about his understanding of bhakti. And then Krishna transcendentally creates a pastime 
to teach him humility. So this next stage is humbling of Narada Muni. So Narada, the wandering stage, once said in a deep meditation, as, as was always the case when individuals perform such intense penances, Indra, the king of Devas, got worried. He had no idea that the Rishi's intent behind the penances was, and Indra assumed that it, ha it had to do with the desire to gain lordship over Swarga. So to disturb the, the concentration and, the render, and, and render his meditation fruitile, Indra sent forth the god of desire on Manthan or Kamadev. To distract Narada with his charms, Indra was aware that Narada's adherence to brahmacharya was celibacy, but it took an ascetic with the determination of the great Mahadev Shiva to be able to resist on Manthan. So it is said that even Lord Shiva is with great powers can resist the, the, the powers of Man Manta or Kamadeva to distract him. So Bra Narada Muni was practicing Brahmacharya, as you all know, and to break his, his mode of devotion or his penances. Indra is always in fear that if there is great austerities being performed by someone, they're doing it only for getting his kingdom. So similarly, he was thinking Narada Muni was doing that, and therefore he sent Kamadev to dist uh, disturb him. So Man Manmanthan or Kamadev, as he, he was called for his part, attempted enthusiastically to entice Narada. He transformed the barren mountain upon which the sage sat into the grove of warm, fragrant air, the snow to the snow to musical fountains, and the scrubs to floral wines. He even asked some of Indra's most attractive apsaras to dance and seduce Narada in any way possible. When the sage did not, when the sage did not so much as open his eyes, Tamadev resorted to his best bet, his potent floral arrows launched from his special sugarcane bow, which had momentarily affected even Lord Shiva. Kama remembered well that the act had cost him his life. As Shiva then burned him to ashes upon realizing that he had been duped. But this was a different day in a different age. So of course, Kamadev doesn't learn his lessons. He tried to entice Lord Shiva and Lord Shiva, when he got disturbed uh, from his meditation, he opened his third eye and burnt Kamadev to ashes. And then of course, later on he was revived, but he doesn't learn from his lessons. But here is saying that this is a different time, different age. So maybe things will come differently. There is a saying sometimes that if we keep practicing doing the same thing and hoping that every time we do the same thing, there will be a different result, that is called foolishness. Only a foolish person will keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. You do the same thing, obviously you'll get the same result. So here, of course, Kamadev is a foolish person thinking that he will get a different result. So taking aim, Manmantan, the Deva of Kama, shot his arrow straight at Narada's chest where the sage's heart was housed. And Narada did not open his eyes. Admitting to what his defeat and the greatness of Narada, Kamadev fell at his feet and begged for the sage's forgiveness. Narada at, la at last opened his eyes and was surprised to find Manmantana posterior before him. He showed gentle and bene benevolent amusement to the Deva, while the latter recounted all that had happened. But really, the sage's heart swelled with an inordinate amount of pride. As soon as Kamadev left, Nada headed straight to Kailas, the abode of Lord Shiva, the destroyer. Of course, now Nada is feeling so proud that even Shiva for momentarily got melted by the powers of Kamadev. But me, I could, could not be disturbed by him. Just see, I am more higher than Lord Shiva. So then he goes to Lord Shiva and he says, Shiva seemed pleased to note Nada's achievement. You have humbled me, great Devrishi Narada, for no longer I am the lone tamer of Kamadev. But speak not about this to Haridev, where his words accompanied by mischievous smile. So of course, Lord Shiva was enticing uh, Narada Muni and saying in a, in a, in a 
Mas akasti ko eh, that don't tell this to Lord Lord Hari, the Hari uh, Lord Vishnu or Hari Deva. So Nanda took his leave, bemused, a little miffed. Why would Shiva ask him not to share this momentous achievement with Vishnu, of whom he he was a sworn lying lifelong devotee? He, it made no sense to Nanda, who concluded that Shiva must surely be jealous of him, and not and that. Only made him prouder of himself. So Narada is very power, proud of himself, and saying, "I am going to go and tell Lord Lord Vishnu about my achievements." So Narada, disregarding Shiva's words, excitedly made a haste towards Vaikuntha, to the abode of Vishnu. There he saw the preserver of the world asleep in his divine sleep, Yoga Nidra. Before Narada could utter his customary Nara and Nara and cover Vishnu's lips curled. Into a smile, in his deep, soothing voice, Vishnu said, "Welcome, Narada Muni. What brings you to me?" Of course, Lord, Lord, the Supreme Lord. He knows everything, past, present, future. He knows every single act going on in his cosmic creation. So he knew exactly very well what is Narada Muni up to. So the Lord, with his smile, is saying, "What brings you to me, O Narada?" Narada Muni. Narada was. Brimming with excitement, he overlooked the fact that Vishnu was pulling his leg by asking him. For the for the preserver knew all that went on in the worlds. Nara narrated to him the great, in great detail, and with the flare of bit of exaggeration, all that happened on the mountain. Even the great god Mahadev, not acknowledged me as his superior, said Nara. Vishnu merely smiled and smiled on Nara. I ever felt disappointed at the lack of the heartier response from Vishnu. This was not something he had expected. Shiva feeling envious was understandable, but Vishnu, he was thinking, why is Vishnu not so excited about my my achievement? Is is he envious of me or what? He concluded that he was probably superior in some aspect to even Vishnu. Or why else? Would the preserver not openly loud his achievement? He felt even more pleased with himself now, with the thought that, with an elaborate bow, with an elaborate bow, Narada took Vishnu's leave. His parting, Naraya, Naraya, was laced with a hint of mockery, and the sage made his made for the one realm where he would be given his due recognition, and where everyone would surely come seeking for his blessings. Now the realms of the mortals, the Tiloka. So he made his way to the uh, this mortal world, the material world, where obviously you know people would have great regard and respect to Narada Muni. But at least they, say, they will appreciate me. So he came here for appreciation. Narada had the ability to transverse all planets, all plans of existence, and in his wanderings, he had covered almost all places where all places there were to cover. However, When he entered Prithvi Loka from Vaikuntha, at this time he, he saw around him the land that he had, the land that he had hitherto not visited, a city magnificent enough to match up to any capital of the Almighty Arya Kingdom of renown. The great in, greatly intrigued him. Narada explored around, wishing to know where and in whose kingdom he was. He looked for the places where people were congregated that might learn something from them, from from their conversations. Of course, so Narada Narada Muni was completely bewildered with uh, seeing this place for the first time. It was befitting like a Vaikuntha place. He was saying, "This is this is not Vaikuntha. So what is this place?" He was trying to figure out from the busy streets where the marketplace flourished. He gathered that this was the kingdom of a certain. Shila Nidhi, from the songs on the roads, he learned. He also learned that the king had a daughter, and that her swineherd was imminent. Nada thought that one as well travelled as he should not let this opportunity of meeting the king of the land, such as this, go by. So he decided to pay the visit to the king. So of course, uh, the king's name is Shila Nidhi. So he visited, visited there. King Shilanidhi welcomed the sage with great honor and adoration. 
he personally washed the sage's feet and served him with refreshments. It is my, it is my great honor to have Narada, wisest among the sages, Lord, Lord over Kama, visit my humble realm. I would consider it an even greater honor if the Devarishi would bless my daughter that she may find a suitable groom. In, in, in his manner, in his, his manner pleased Narada, who was surprised when the mortal addressed him as Lord over Kama. News indeed travels fast. His most gracious, he, he, he most graciously accepted the request to bless the king's daughter and see she was summoned. Simati, King Shilanidhi's daughter, was the most beautiful woman Narada had ever laid his eyes upon. The sage could think of no woman complier than her, and he was possessed by the, the desperate desire to marry her. He took Narada every bit of his sagely resolve and concentrate to appear unaffected by the flames of desire burning in his, in his in inward way. In his inner way. To Sheila Nidhi, he said, this girl is surely Sri Devi herself, the concert of Hari Deva. Happily, you have named her Srimati. One has, one as radiant as Hari shall be the one to wed her. This is the blessings of Narada Muni. And one who will marry this beautiful girl will be just like Hari. Because he, she is so beautiful, uh, like the goddess Lakshmi, that her husband will be befitting like Lord Vishnu. The, the king was jubilant upon hearing that and was so, and was Simati. Shila Nidhi requested Narada to come and grace the Swayamvar, which was but a few days away. Narada, of course, considered secretly intending to treat the request as an invitation to participate in the Swayamvar. He soon bade farewell. <laughs> he soon bade farewell to the king and Simati, uh, Simati, and went about exploring the beautiful city further. Nada could not stop thinking about the girl he had seen. There was one, no none comparable to her, save Lakshmi herself. And rightly he had said that only a man like Haridev should should be chosen to be her husband or cho chosen by her. But Narada desperately de decided to be that man. So the sage desperately, de the sage deliberated over the matter for quite a while. He reasoned that he mostly had the qualities that her, that her ideal husband should have. Well, if Shiva and Vishnu were envious of him, surely he was supremely splendid individual, wasn't he? There was this matter of his, excuse me, there was just the matter of his face, perhaps not being all that attractive. A man like Hari should have a face like Hari. And who better to borrow that face from than Hari himself? And so Narada prayed to the one he had chosen to be devoted all his life. He prayed to Lord Vishnu to appear before him. Just before the Swayamvar, Vishnu came to him. Speak, dear Narada, what do you wish of me? Narada, <clears throat> name your desire for which you have chosen to appropriate me in a place of just coming and visiting me in Vaikuntha as usually. So of course, Narada, uh, Vishnu is saying that normally you come to see me, but you have you summoned me. Why? What do you want? So Narada, in spite of his newfound hubris, was avoided, overrode by the sight of Vishnu before him, ready to grant him his wish. A potent combination of reverence for Vishnu and desire for Srimati forced Narada to, to sing. Using Grandai's lyrics composed of sans, in Sanskrit, high pitch, Narada asked Vishnu for a face like Hari. Thus too, said Vishnu, of course, Narada, in his excitement, is asking Lord Vishnu that I want a face like you. So, using Grandas lyrics composed in Sanskrit high pitch, Narada asked Vishnu for a face like Hari. When sung in high pitch, the name Hari means monkey. 
So of course, Vishnu thought, you want a face like a monkey? So trust to, I will give you the face of monkey. So Nara's original face is there. And then by seeking the blessings of Vishnu, he gets a face of a monkey. And then he's thinking, now I will go to the Swayamvara. So Srimadhi Swayamvara was attended by kings and princes from far and wide. Nada confidently walked into the hall, dressed simply in his usual ascetic manner, carrying his veena. He looked condescendingly upon all the gathered suitors. What chance did they stand against him, who had the qualities of the highest individual in the face of Samasunda Haridev? Srimati was sure to choose him as her groom. He was so lost in the dreams of the life that he, he led, he, that he had led with Srimati, that it never struck him that everyone was pointing at him and laughing. At last, the swiver was thrown open and Srimati entered the hall. Every pair of eyes were, was upon her. Scores of breaths were drawn, but never released by her beauty was mesmerizing. Getting the flower, uh, flower garland in her hands, she took a look at the suitors after the suitors and kept moving ahead, rejecting each one she had looked at. Nada, who was the very last in line, was beaming with pride. Of course, she would reject them, reject them all, for they were mere mortals. He, on the other hand, was above all of them, learned in the scriptures, proficient in the art, gifted with the ability to travel across the planets, across all the planets of existence, supremely tapasvi, conqueror of Kamadev, and beautiful as Hari. The only reason he wore simple robes and carried his signature veena was that Simati, Simati be, be able to recognize him as Narada, for she was respectful. She was she was respectfully avoiding seeing the face when she when he paid her the visit, but would would have definitely noticed that he carried a veena. She had still not chosen any of the contestants as her husband, and she was coming closer and closer, reaching to the end of the line. Nada was full of dream, with anticipation, excitement. And when she finally came to him, it was as though time had slowed down manifold. She, she, he could see her lowered eyes raise to look at him, reflected, reflect his face in, in him, reflect his face to him, light up in myth and look down again. Her lips curled ever so gently in a smile that was mischievous and knowingly and her being as she moved away from him to one standing behind him. At that moment, it ceased to matter to him that there could have, couldn't have been anyone standing behind him as he was the last one in the line. It, it even ceased to matter to him that she had actually rejected him. All that mattered to him was the reflection of the face that he had seen in Srimati's eyes. It was not what he had expected to see, not the face of Vishnu, not even his own face, but the face of a monkey. So of course, Narada <laughs> was kind of chuffed, but then he realized that he has a face of a monkey. Narada being so consumed by anger and betrayal, without having to turn back, he knew who could be the only one standing behind him. He also knew that Srimati would have placed her garland around his neck. He, he knew this because he had blessed her himself. A curse was upon his lips, directed at the source of his misery, to the one who had cheated him for personal gain. But before he could utter it, he heard the voice of that being come from behind. Nada! Or was it coming from the front of him? It, it seemed to be everywhere, Nada closed his eyes and his ears to lose sense of the world around him. Nada said, Nada said the voice. He opened his eyes and before him was Vishnu wearing the same garland 
on his neck as Srimati had before Srimati had been holding, confirming Narada's deduction. Besides seeing, besides seeing was Srimati, except that her aspect looked somewhat different. She looked less like a human and more like a goddess. And also much more familiar. Narada realized that it was, in fact, not Srimati. He, he, he looked, but, <coughs> sorry, he was not Srimati he looked at, but Sri Devi, Lakshmi, Lakshmi Devi herself. He looked around him and saw that they were all in Vaikuntha. Ananta says, vast expanse had coiled upon the Sir, Sir Saga, the ocean of milk, and upon it rested Vishnu and Sri. It was only then he realized that he realized, of course, Yoga Maya was playing tricks with him. Vishnu smiled at Narada. Of course, your, you curse me, your, your curse for me, Devarishi Deva Narada, is an interesting consequence of this entire sequence of event. I accept it gladly. Verily, there, there will come a time when I shall need to seek the help of beings akin to what you show yourself as. Vanaras will guide me to free in finding Sri, but that time is far away yet. Nada was embarrassed beyond measures. This was indeed the curse that he had been about to utter. Vishnu continued, but tell me, dear Narada, how did you conquer Kamadev's feeling, feel about, about to fling away his oath of lifelong brahmacharya and willing to become a victim of Kama's sting? Narada was humbled. What, what could he say? Enlightened and, uh, and enlightened and comprehension upon whereupon he enlightenment and comprehensions were upon him already, just as he had finished bragging about his conquering of Kamadev to Vishnu, the preserver had invoked his power of Yoga Maya, matrix of illusion, to teach Narada a lesson of humility. The reality as the sage perceived had been manipulated and controlled by Vishnu himself. There was no kingdom of Silanidhi or no Srimati. It was Lakshmi playing, playing along with her concerts game. And Narada was unwittingly, but surely brought, brought the joke of his Samian face upon himself by asking a face like Hari in Sanskrit. Hari meant Vishnu, of course, but it also meant monkey in a high pitch. As Vishnu had deliberately chosen to go with the second meaning to initiate the chain of event that led to Narada's rejection and humiliation, the Swayamvar, a reminder of a consequence of straying away from one's path of strengthening oneself and failing a prey to hubris. Hubris is a word which is not quite often used, means excessively confidence or arrogance. So we are always in this condition. We become excessively confident and arrogant about our position when we achieve something which is above the normal. And therefore, there's a caution given in this story that we should become very much conscious and, and uh, mindful that we do not become overly arrogant about our situation or our possession or our position. Simply remain humble. So that was one humbling the, uh, we can say, Narada Muni, and this is the second story, breaking the pride of Narada Muni. So Narada Muni quite often gets into this trouble. And uh, of course, Lord Vishnu is always with him. And therefore, when Narada gets into trouble, the Lord is always there to protect him from uh, falling a prey to these uh, conditions and uh, continue with his uh, transcendental spiritual life. So Narada Muni, in this picture, is shot carrying a pot of uh, oil on his head, and Lord Vishnu is observing him. So the story goes, the holy, holy said Narada, clothed in flowing robes, his hair piled upon his head, set in the heaven of fluffy white clouds, and played on his sitar. His fingers moved nimbly across the strings, and the music flowed without crossing, without ceasing. He sang in the heavenly voice, song after song, praising his beloved Lord Vishnu. So, of course, as you all know, Narada is always singing the glories of the Lord, 
and his comfortable situation, he's so absorbed in singing that he's a little bit lost in, in, in the transcendental sound vibration of the holy, holy name. This was his favorite pastime. He loved Lord Vishnu with all his heart and nothing pleased him more than sitting for hour after hour, recounting all the wonderful attributes of the great God. The, the time slipped by and Nada was entranced by his own music and, kept, and the captivating qualities of the Lord. And the gem of an idea warmed, his, warmed its way into his mind. I sit all day playing on my sitar and singing the praises of the great Lord Vishnu, he thought, recounting his exploits and worshipping him. I must be the greatest of the devotees of the Lord. And, and his thought warmed, and this thought warmed Narada's heart. He turned it over and over in his mind until he, until he could sit still no longer. So he rose from his seat and made his way into the very presence of the Lord. Lord Vishnu, resplendent in his majestic, was seated on a golden lotus throne with his wife Lakshmi beside him. Beautiful maidservants paint the divine couple and the majestic peacock with their tails fully extended, strutted through and, to and fro. Narada bowed low with his hands pressed together with a respectful greeting. Narada, my faithful friend, welcome, welcome, said the Lord, said Lord Vishnu, smiling. Come and sit beside me and ask me your question. Oh Lord, said Narada. When he had seated himself beside Lord Vishnu, you know what it is, what is in my heart before I do. You know my questions already. Yes, that is true. But I love my devotees to ask their questions themselves. Oh Lord. With your divine permission, I will therefore speak. My question is this. I sit day after day, joyfully singing your praises. Without ceasing, I think, I think uh, about you. Am I indeed your greatest devotee? Yes, my, my dear Nada, you are indeed my greatest devotee. Nada was so was overjoyed to hear this until the Lord, until Lord Vishnu raised his finger and continued. With one exception, O Narada, there is one other of my devotee who is greater than you. Narada, Narada was astonished and begged to meet the, and worship, the, worship at the feet of this great, this, this giant of a devotee, a devotion. This great sage, this God-like being whose devotion to Lord Vishnu was greater, greater even than his. So, of course, the Lord and Narada Muni visits this person's house, but the story grew stranger still. The Lord, for Lord Vishnu continued, this devotee is no king or a great sage. No, he is an ordinary man, said Lord Vishnu, a humble farmer who lives on earth. If you are still eager to meet him, we will visit, visit him together, but we must disguise ourselves as ordinary men. Narada readily agreed, and in the blink of, of an eye, he and the blessed Lord Vishnu, disguised as dusty travelers, were standing in front of the door of a farmhouse. They knocked on the door, which was opened by a young girl who stayed, stayed up, who stared at, at them in wonder. Who is there? came the voice from inside. Two men, said the girl. Praise to be Lord, praise to be Lord Vishnu who has sent two guests to partake our hospitality and share our meal. Oh, daughter, invite them in, in at once in the name of Lord. And the voice, which was soon to follow by the farmer's, farmer himself. The man, bowed, the man bowed to the two strangers and begged them to join his family for an evening meal. Vishnu and Nada did so, set, cro set cross-legged around the rustic mat with the man, his wife, and his, his four children. The farmer said a short prayer for, of thanks and blessings over the food that everybody, everybody served each other and were all satisfied with a simple country fare. The man offered his guest a bed for the night and praised the Lord when they accepted his invitation. 
Early next, next day, a similar scene was played, played out. The man offered the short prayer and then a simple meal was prepared and shared with the guest. After which the farmer left his wife and, his, and the younger children to attend the household chores. While he and his eldest son left for the fields and the cattle shed, the disguised Lord asked if he and his friend could observe the farmer at work for the day, which he gladly agreed to. After offering some few words of thanks to God, the four of them set off. The men settled to, uh, to milk, uh, settle milking the cows and hummed a hymn of devotion to Lord Vishnu. As the milking pail filled and his son carried them back to the house, the milking done, he wiped his brows, gave thanks to the Lord once more, and then headed off to the fields to attend the crops. After a whole day spent in this fashion, he and his son, tired after a long day's work, said a short prayer together and prepared to head once more for home. Lord Vishnu and Nada thanked him and looked for, looked for, uh, and took their leave. They had walked for a few minutes and they had arrived at the foot of a small hill when Nada, bursting with curiosity, could contain him, himself no longer. Oh Lord, forgive me, but I must ask you about this man whom you say is your greatest devotee. I see he is a hardworking man of virtue, kind to strangers, and one who cares for his family and his, life, his livestock. But his devotion was short, of, short and occasional. He, he said a prayer in between his other activities, which took his whole attention. Surely my unbroken devotion to you are superior to his. Lord Vishnu looked thoughtfully and smiled. Perhaps Narada, you are right. Perhaps this fine fellow is not your superior or even your equal in devotion to me. Narada beamed this praise from the Lord. And the Lord continued, yes, now that I think about it, perhaps you are my greatest devotee. Might I ask you therefore to complete a task for me? Narada was all eagerness to comply, yes. He said, yes, my Lord, anything. I will fly to the moon and back. I will bring you the precious jewels from the highest Himalayas. I will journey to the sacred Ganges and bring you the holy water. Just ask. You are, you are in my heart and you are in my thoughts unceasingly. Lord Vishnu laughed and said, oh Narada, you are truly the prince of devotees. No, I have a much simpler task for you. And with that, he held out, he, out his hand, and in it appeared a large jar filled with the, filled to the brim, very brim with oil. Take this jar of oil and balance it on it and carefully on your head. Then walk around this small hill and don't spill a single drop. Now, Nada was mystified by this strange request, but excited to prove his devotion he carefully took the jar of oil and slowly lifted it up and placed it on, placed it gingerly on top of his head. Slowly he move, removed his hands and began to take one cautious step after another. With, the, with his arms spread wide to maintain his balance, he slowly shuffled forward until, until rounding the hill, he could see Lord Vishnu waiting for him. Finally, he arrived and triumphantly placed the jar of oil at the Lord's, Lord Vishnu's feet. There he said, I didn't spill a drop. Wonderful, oh faithful friend. And might I ask, how many times did you think of me? How many prayers did you offer to me? How many songs of praise did you sing to me? Why none, stammered Narada. I was too busy concentrating on the jar of oil. I was totally absorbed in making sure not a drop was spilled. Yes, said Lord Vishnu. You had your jar of oil, which drove, you, which drove all thoughts of me from your mind. But our farmer friend with a wife to care for and four hungry children to feed and the guests to, to entertain and the farm to manage with the cows to milk, the crops to tend. Remember me time and again, he offers praise. He sings songs of praise. 
and he remembers me again and again. Tell me, Narada, who do you now believe to be the greatest devotee? And Narada, humbled, bowed low, he, pay, he praised the humble farmer as the great, greatest of devotee and thanked the Lord for his gracious lesson. Lesson to learn, not to be proud of your devotion to the Supreme Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna appreciates everyone's efforts. For example, when Hanuman was lifting big boulders to make the bridge to Lanka, a small squirrel was lifting small stones. Hanuman started to laugh and said, this is not for you. Just look at me. I am lifting big boulders. Very proud of his strength, Lord Rama said, do not be so proud, Hanuman. Everyone offers their service according to their ability. So we should learn very important lessons from Narada's pastimes that don't become proud of whatever service you render, but in humility, just offer the best you can and Krishna will reciprocate. So Hanuman is lifting big, big boulders. And as you can see in that little black circle I've drawn around Hanuman, a squirrel in the background with a small stone and Rama is very expertly guiding them how to build the bridge to cross Sri Lanka. And after Hanuman being so proud, Lord Ramachandra takes the little squirrel in his lap and strokes it and blesses it and, say, and says to Hanuman, my dear Hanuman, don't be proud. Everyone offers their service according to their ability. And therefore we should respect and honor all living entities who render service to the Supreme Lord Vishnu. So we should be very, very careful and mindful that this is the learning we should take away from uh, these pastimes of Narada Muni. And of course, this, the, the last story is uh, just in short words, Hanuman and uh, Lord Ramachandra. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much. For uh, for this wonderful session, and uh, you know, very uh, the the story was really uh, very very uh, educative. Uh, that in our Krishna consciousness, how we have to stay in a very very humble state of mind. Um, I would um, request now the devotees if there are any quick questions before we end the session. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask question from Maharaj. We'll just have you uh, so that you can, you're able to unmute. So any questions? Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. This is Anu Agarwal. Jai. Yes, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Uh, I had one question that when we started the PPTs, uh, there it was said, it was written about uh, praising Lord Vishnu, Narada, and we know Narada is always saying Narayan, Narayan, which in my understanding means Lord Vishnu. But we are told uh, that we must praise and supreme personality of Godhead is Sri Krishna. So this is a confusion. I, whenever I try and talk to a lot of um, uh, devotees, we have this confusion. Uh, whether to praise or sing and chant for Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna. Uh, if you could just uh, put some light on, shed some light on this. Maharaj. Yes, for sure. Of course, we know that uh, there is uh, Vishnu Saharsana, 1000 names of Vishnu. And of course, there are um, unlimited names of Krishna according to his pastimes, his attributes, you know, his interaction with different devotees. So Krishna, as Srila Prabhupada explains, is the original name of the Supreme Lord. But he has many names. So it, it, it doesn't matter which name we actually call the Supreme Lord by. As long as your intent and understanding is that it is meant for the Supreme Lord, whether you call Narayan, we call Vishnu, we call Vamana or uh, Narsinga, any names, of the Lord is, is equally powerful and important. But we should understand that these all names are addressing the same person. Just like, for example, that uh, I would assume that you are you're married, so you have a husband. 
And when you get married, get to know your husband very well, then there's intimacy between the husband and uh, wife. So the wife has a name for a husband, a pet name. And you will address the husband by the pet name. Then there are children. They also address the, the father by a different name. Then there are his close friends. They will address him by his uh, nickname. Then there are official people will address him by his official name. So they are say, calling him by different names, but the person is the same. So similarly, it's explained that the Lord has many, many names. And when we address him by this name, it is to the same Lord. So of course, we are so used to Narada Muni singing on his uh, transcendental veena, Narayan, Narayan, because this is what is portrayed in what, you, what I call the entertainment industry. When you see the, the movies of some spiritual uh, nature or some dramas, and Narada Muni is uh, portrayed as a, as a comical character singing Narayan, Narayan. So we, when we hear Narada Muni, we think this. But actually, Narada Muni is the most exalted, most transcendental personality there ever is. He's not a joker. Um, so when he sings these names, he, his, na his intent is to address the Supreme Lord. So we should not get ourselves confused. Of course, there's a difference when we call the Supreme Lord by his many multiple names. And the distinction, as I said, is that demigods have different names. So we cannot uh, say that the names of demigods are same as the net that of Lord Vishnu. I hope that can clarify your understanding. But before we go deeper uh, with your guidance, I hope I'll be more, uh, it'll, I'll understand better. I hope so. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, our next question is from Sachin Rajay Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Danvat Pranam. I had a question. When did the story of Narada happen? Before he got his transcendental body or after that? No, no. The story, two stories which we recited, one is uh, uh, Narada Muni becoming bewildered by uh, Lord Vishnu and Simati Lakshmi Devi. And the, uh, the second story was of uh, Narada being very proud of a great devotee. These were the stories when he is born from the body of Brahma as Narada Muni. Then the, the previous birth we, we discussed as a maid servant and prior to that as a Gandharva, they were in different millenniums. But this was in the last millennium when Lord Brahma created the universe and from his body, Narada Muni appeared. Right. Thank you, Maharaj. We have another question. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yeah, Sachin um, Prabhu, please, you would like to speak. Prabhuji, yeah. so, sorry, sorry to... No, 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 please speak. speak up, Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, thank you wonderful, for the wonderful class. Um, Maharaj, my uh, question, uh, just to elaborate a little bit, uh, was because once when um, one comes out of the material realm, then um, he does not uh, fall prey to the Maya is what I understood. Then how come one after he gets a transcendental body can uh, get bewildered by Maya? If you can elaborate, Maharaj, thank you so much. You have to understand that ordinary living entities, they fell uh, prey to the illusion energy, what we call Maya. The transcendental personalities, they don't fall in Maya but they act an enrollment to participate in the transcendental pastimes of the Lord. So if you look at all the different pastimes, they're all interlinked to some extent. Like for example, uh, when uh, Narada Muni was saying, I want to face like Hari. So of course Vishnu is saying, oh, you want Hari means monkey. So he gives a monkey face. And then Narada is cursing the, uh, the Lord with the intent of cursing, but then Lord knows his curse anyway. And that in my another pastime, when I come as Lord Ramachandra, I will take the, uh, the monkey clan to assist me to find Sita and then bring her back to Ayodhya. So these are all interrelated. So the, the devotees of the Lord don't fall into Maya, but they are put into kind of yoga Maya, the transcendental Maya of the Lord, which puts you temporarily in illusion to enact a role. 
So then if you are un under that uh, uh, yoga maya, then you can act that role. Otherwise, you cannot act that role. Just like uh, Prabhupada gives example that Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj, if they knew that their little Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then they cannot have that rasa of, of the parental love between Krishna and his mother and his father. So therefore, yoga maya covers them and then they can act as father and mother and, and, and cons be concerned for Krishna's well-being at every moment. Whenever uh, the de demon sent by uh, Kansa has come to harm Krishna, they would perform all kinds of yagyas for protection of Krishna. But if they knew that Krishna is the Supreme Lord, then there is no need to do this. But there's a special rasa going on. So the Supreme Lord uses his yoga maya potency. So there's two types of maya. One is maha maya, which is what we fall into. And there is yoga maya, which is the transcendental aspect, which is done as part of Krishna's transcendental pastimes. And if this pastime is going to take place, then of course Krishna has to cover you up. If you, if you are not covered by this yoga maya, then you cannot act as, as the, as the uh, particular uh, lila requires. Is that cl clearing your doubt? Perfect, Maharaj. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Dandot Pranam. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Sachin Prabhu. Uh, Ananga Manjari Priya Mataji, would you like to ask the question yourself by un unmuting yourself or should I speak your question? Hare Krishna Prabhu, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavat Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, as you mentioned that uh, Narada Muni, uh, he had no separate soul, same body. Yes. So, so my question is like uh, the Swarga Devatas, all the demigods, do they also have the same thing? No, 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 no. You have to understand, Narada Muni is a transcendental personality. Once he is liberated from the material bondage, he goes to the spiritual world. And because Narada Muni is given special powers that he can enter the, the material world and the spiritual world in, in, a, in, a, in the same body, so that is different. But the Swarga Loka, even to the highest planet, which is called uh, Brahma Loka and Satya Loka, which is the highest in the material world, to, to the lowest uh, Patala Lokas, all planetary system, everybody has a material body and, and in that material body, the soul is encaged to fulfill a particular desire or particular action they may want to perform according to their desires, according to their karma. But once you are liberated, then you go, uh, as Prabhupada explains, Nitya Swarup, your eternal Swarupa. So that your eternal Swarupa is not made of Panchabhuta, it is transcendental. Just like when Krishna comes into this material world, he doesn't take a material body. His 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 uh, transcendental body, spiritual body, and he's in his original form. So similarly, uh, a, a, a personality who is sent from the spiritual world to the material world to enact a particular role, then he takes, uh, you know, he he comes in his transcendental body. He doesn't come in a material body. He doesn't take birth like ordinary person. So just like uh, uh, Narada Muni, he appeared from the body of uh, Brahma. In other words, he he used that uh, uh, medium to enter the material world, but he did not take birth from the womb of a mother. There was not a union between a man and a woman and then birth took place. So all great personalities, they are not born in ordinary way. They, they appear in this world. That's why we are, when we celebrate uh, the appearance day of these personalities, we call the appearance of their, not birth of these persons. They appear, hmm. they appear, to different mediums to per, uh, perform a particular task for the Lord. So therefore, Narada body was not ordinary. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, I have one more question, if you allow me. Yes, yes, uh, no problem. Uh, Maharaj, like just now you mentioned to that Prabhu that uh, because of, uh, like Narada also became illusioned because of yoga maya potency. So mm -hmm. uh, last class, we you have mentioned that like Brahma, he may also uh, maybe under the illusion. So yeah. that Brahma Bhimohan Leela, what has happened? And last class, what we read about the Saraswati, he was chasing uh, behind Saraswati. So we can uh, see that that was also uh, due to Yogamaya potency or Mahamaya? No, no, Yogamaya. See, great personalities, 
they don't come under the supervision of your mahamaya they come under the yoga maya because they are performing particular act on 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 the behest of the lord so the lord arranges his pastimes and they come as actors to play a particular role and the only way they can play this role is when yoga maya covers their original understanding and take up the uh, the understanding of a particular actor they are supposed to be, be acting as and then they take on take on that role okay so got it maharaj um, maharaj one more like uh, in uh, brahma's prayer we see that brahma also when he was uh, creating this material world supposed to create the material world he also prayed to lord uh, krishna that he should not come under this illusion so why he is asking this kind of prayer no you see a, a devotee always prays to lord that please protect me and uh, protect me from falling uh, into illusion into maya so even great devotees even like sri prabhupada the pure devotee of the lord he is saying that i pray to krishna that i don't fall into maya of course there's no question of sri prabhupada falling into maya but as bhagavad gita says yad yad acharati sisters whatever great man does the common man follows so the great man is showing that he is also fallible so he is saying that look don't get into illusion pray like this so when you are praying in this mood then you are actually accepting the supreme lord supremacy and begging him that always protect me from these uh, fallible situations so that is uh, our uh, lesson to us by these great acharyas or great personalities although they are themselves are not going to fall into their situation but they 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 teach us by their own example just like vaishnava songs when you sing uh, hear the uh, songs of narottam das thakur or bhakti mr thakur they say i am like a worm in the stool i am so fallen i am bereft of love of krishna and radha but bhakti mr thakur he is every breath is radha and krishna narottam das thakur is totally absorbed in krishna but he is showing an example that in the material world we fall uh, victims of illusion therefore we can be, as i said in the, that you know pride and arrogance is everywhere If someone comes and glorifies you little bit you automatically say, yes oh i am such a great person and so feeling no 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 actually i am not such a great person but i am so grateful that i can do something nice for the pleasure of the lord and his devotees so we learn from this uh, great personalities that is why yad yad acharya says this says, krishna says in the bhagavad gita that whatever great man does the common man will learn from them so the great men or the great personalities through their experience they are teaching us how to become humble and and, and make those prayers okay maharaj thank you thank you so much maharaj hari krishna hari krishna nanga manjuri mata ji we have a, a question coming in from divya gorangi mata ji Divya Gorangi Mataji, please ask your question. Thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All Hare. glories to Sri Lopapa. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, very, very insightful class. Thank you so much. Learning so much about uh, Great Narada Muni, Maharaj. Uh, my question is, I have a little confusion. So, uh, when the night of Brahma comes, uh, what happens to these great souls? do they go back in garbha daksha vishnu or what is their destination at night time of brahma well those who are going to come come back to perform a particular duty for the lord in his cosmic creation then they they come back again to the material world uh, through brahma's next day's creation others they go back to the spiritual world so for example when brahma's day ends and not even brahma's day but like say uh, let's say example indra dev indra is in his position as the king of heaven when he finishes his, his time and his term is finished then he will go back to the spiritual world so at, at the every end of uh, brahma's day when uh, the whole creation unwinds it is temporarily uh, put into suspension what you and i can understand in ordinary terms is that if you are playing say some uh, some uh, video and uh, some important phone call comes then what do you do you press the pause button so the pause button comes and it stops 
and you can attend to your phone call everything. After that, you unpause and it continues. So similarly, at the night of Brahma, the pause comes. And then the day of Brahma, unpause comes and he starts again the creation. Amazing. Thank you so much for that analogy, Maharaj. I could understand clearly. Sorry, one more question regarding uh, similar to this uh, connection is, um, so Maharaj, what happens when, because each Brahma has his lifespan, even uh, the Brahma of our universe, this universe will have a death, right? So, yeah. yes, Maharaj. So, um, my question is when the, the, after the complete dissolution, when the next new universe forms, will Narad Muni be there? Does this all repeat or what happens? Like, yes, it... Narad Muni is a transcendental personality, is the intimate associate of the Lord. So the Lord and his associates, they come a millennium after millennium after millennium. That's why even Krishna says, some Bhavami Yuge Yuge, that millennium after millennium I come, in my different forms, my different avatars. Of course, we don't have access to all the knowledge of his transcendental avatars because it is said in, in uh, by Prabhupada that Ananta says with his thousand heads, with the thousand tongues, he is repeating so many past, uh, not repeating, but he's saying so many past times and glories of the Lord, and still he is not repeating one again. So there are unlimited avatars, unlimited past times. But in the present stage of our, our, our existence, we have access to a limited understanding, although in, in, a, in a higher sense it's unlimited, because Bhagavatam is pretty unlimited uh, knowledge. Well, the thing is that this knowledge is given to us in our context of our present yuga, our present state of our existence. But every millennium after millennium, there are many, many different pastimes, there are many situations which we don't even know about, because they happen in different yugas and different times and different millenniums. So, but the transcendental personalities and associates of the Lord, they come uh, time after time after time without fail. Because they are integrated souls. They are not conditioned. Thank you so much, Mara. This is really amazing, mind-blowing that Ananta Shesha is not repeated even one past time. So, sorry, Mara, just final question, that from material world right up to Vaikuntha and Goloka Dham, does Narad Muni have access to go right up to Goloka Dham? He, he goes and he's traveling all these planets. This is so fortunate that he's just... <laughs> singing glories of Lord and is he just coming, going to all universes and even goes to Goloka? He can go anywhere in this whole creation of the Lord, material or spiritual. Amazing. He, he can go to the transcendental Goloka Dham and uh, uh, be part of uh, some pastime there and interact with the Lord. He can go to Siddha Mayapur and dance with Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> and he can come to this material world and he can dance with us. Prabhupada <laughs> said, Narada Muni was dancing in our kirtan. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Oh, we can't see him, but Prabhupada saw him. Wow, yeah. So, uh, this is amazing. So, Maharaj, what is that special thing? This Nar I know you explained everything. He's a very big devotee, but he must have done... This is like amazing, the benediction he got. So, what is it that he? Uh, this was awarded to him? Well, the thing is, you see... We can all become Narada Munis <laughs> if we have pure devotion for the Lord. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it, it is not that Narada Muni did something very unique. He just had pure unalloyed, unalloyed devotion for the Lord. Every word, every breath is Krishna, Supreme Lord. He doesn't mm -hmm. think anything outside of Krishna. And therefore, uh, he is given this transcendental position as one of the great Mahajans to transverse through the universe, everywhere, in this, in the material world, in the heavenly planets, everywhere, and sing the glories and encourage everyone to do Sankirtan. So we, uh, from the first story, we, uh, Narayan Muni himself says, as a Gandharva, I was singing the glories all the time. And then uh, I got overwhelmed by the material opulence that started singing demigods glorification, because obviously demigods are equally great. And because of that, the Prajapatis were not happy. The demigods would have not said anything. Even Lord Vishnu or Krishna would not say anything. But the Prajapati said, we specifically invited you to sing the glories of the Lord, the Supreme Lord. And he started singing the demigods. 
So therefore, we curse you that you take birth as a sudra. Of course, he came to take his birth as a sudra, but then the, the Supreme Lord Shiva said, oh, no, no, this cannot be uh, good for him. I will go personally and give my association to him in a disguised form. So he got benefit of uh, Lord, Lord Shiva's blessings. And then uh, after he finished his birth as, as uh, Narada, as a maid servant's uh, son, he went uh, into Lord Brahma's body, and then came out as transcendental Narada Muni. So of course, we can all become Narada Munis if you want. Mm-hmm. But it will take hard, hard work to become 100% pure devotional service. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you so much. My hundreds of obeisances to you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, La- Hare. Lastly, Maharaj, both the stories that you explained, they are actual pastimes, right? They are not stories. They are pastimes. No, they are pastimes. Yeah. You see, unfortunately, we know we have been so much uh, corrupted in our, our education that most of these uh, stories are saying, oh, these are some like, you know, fairy tale stories like uh, mm-hmm. Walt Disney, you know, Snow White in the Seven Dwarfs. <laughs> or the uh, uh, what is that princess and the ugly sisters and all these kind of you know uh, uh, fictitious stories. So the British, when they came to India, they saw the only way we can break these Indian people with their high culture and knowledge is to tell them that your following is something mythical. It's a myth. It's not real. Hmm. So even now. There is a big, big debate going on in India with these so-called uh, leftist historians. They, they are twisting and turning everything historical to make us believe that our culture is the third class culture. And even in the schools, they teach us that this is mythology. It's not a mythology. It is theology. It is a theistic. It is real knowledge. It is real. Krishna is real. Rama is real. Shiva is real. Nada is real. Everything is real. But they call this thing as mythological. And then we, we start thinking that this is like uh, mythological stories. It's not stories. It's actually everything which is given by Vyasadev in terms of Puranas and Upanishads. These are all factual knowledge which has been re- written down by the mercy of uh, Vyasadev for the people of Kali Yuga that we have written words so that we can uh, go back again and again and again to read them and understand them. But there are people who are portraying, portraying this knowledge as a kind of mythological. It is, you know, it's just some story, fairy, fairy stories. It's not real. And we begin to believe this. Mm. They're saying if you say a lie a thousand times, it will become a fact. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Maharaj, for the instructive pastimes and really, really enjoyed. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Divya Gaurangi Mataji. Um, Maharaj, we have Rajamani Prabhu. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for teaching us very important lesson from Sri Narad Muni's story. So with that, uh, before we end the session, I would request uh, Maharaj, if we could chant three times the Hare Krishna Mahamantra for his Holiness Jaya Pataka Maharaj, is that okay? Yes, fine. So let's all chant three times the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. These are prayers for, uh, as we all know, that His Holiness Jaya Pataka Maharaj had been, um, you know, found positive with COVID-19, though he did not show uh, the symptoms. They were mild, but yet uh, considering his situation, um, let's pray for his return to good health. So, Maharaj, after you, we will follow you. Hare Krishna, 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 Hare
participation and enthusiastic at that. And also request you to kindly join us for the next session for which we will send you the notifications well in advance. And also the questions for this session will also be sent to all of you. Now there is a message from Shiva Thakur uh, Prabhu, Shiva Mataji, sorry. Hare Krishna Maharaj Danvat Pranam. Uh, that is from Shiva Mataji and from Sadanand Srikant Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj Danvat Pranam and thank you for the wonderful session. So on that note of appreciation, we will end the session today, tonight, and we will see you all next Saturday. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Let's pay our respects to Maharaj. Vancha Kalanga. Swami Maharaj ki divine grace Esi Bhakti Vedanta Swami. Jai. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Krishna.